welcome you. Okay, now I'll welcome you to the launch of the Equity Impact Campaign. If you see me looking down, please um, do not judge me. I was preparing to be standing at a podium at the State House. Um, and so I still have my notes <laughs> written down. Um, despite the weather, I am inspired, I'm motivated, and I'm energized on this snowy day in the middle of March, on Equal Pay Day, on Pi Day, and I'm gonna leave it up to Alan during his presentation to connect the dots with Pi Day and equity for us. I wanna thank you all for joining us here today. And I would like to, this is Zoom, so I'm gonna try my best to recognize um, our elected officials who have also joined us including our legislative champions, um, Senator Acosta, Representative Coverant, Representative Kislak, and then now I'm gonna go and try to find the rest of our legislators who are on Zoom. I see Representative Stewart, Representative Speakman, thank you. and more. <laughs> I'm going to move forward and I'll hopefully, once we have um, everyone um, on the screen, I'll try to recognize the rest of our um, officials who are here and I'll ask the team to please point out officials who are here that I did not see. When we first started, um, I'm not sure what, all right. When we first hosted um, a conversation back in December with community partners, to begin this journey of equity together, I asked a question. Why is equity important to you? There were over 40 people in attendance, so I'm not gonna read all of the responses, but here are a few. Achieving equity is fundamental to the success of every human being in our state. And this was a quote that was shared. How we spent tell us whose lives matter. We won't truly have a thriving state unless we lead with and strive for equity. People of color have been fighting for equity and fair treatment in Rhode Island for four centuries. We all deserve to live in communities that support and enrich and uplift us. There is no true democracy without equity. And all of us deserve the opportunity to live and thrive. Lack of equity is harmful to individuals, communities, and society. You can't talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion without including the disability community. Equity is important to help those who feel invisible to be seen and heard and validated. You can't have equity without gender and racial equity. Equity makes us all healthy, safe, and living with wellness and joy. We have since then come to this point where we have come together with a collective goal to create a more equitable future for all Rhode Islanders by ensuring that policies, programs, and the state budget correct historical disparities and design new policies centered in equity. So here we are, ready to launch a full legislative campaign starting with the release of an equity review of the governor's proposed FY 2024 budget. We know that decisions are made at the State House that have far reaching impacts across communities in Rhode Island. And those decisions too frequently do not consider the impacts of marginalized and historically excluded communities. Equity gets us to the all a Rhode Island where we all can thrive. Equity is also about reflecting upon the past, the present, the data, the lived experiences, and the future. 
And so we have a lineup of dynamic speakers here today. And I would like to start with a reflection on why equity. Please join me in giving a warm welcome in the form of emojis, because we're trying to get people to stay on mute, to a friend, a sister, a community member, and a powerful force in Rhode Island, Alicia Pena. Thank you so much, Ms. Wayona. My piece is called No More Silence, and thank you to Economic Progress Institute for having me today. Um, again, my piece is called No More Silence and it starts with a song and goes right into it. So, I am an endangered species, but I sing no victim song. I am a woman, I'm an artist, and I know my voice belongs, my voice belongs here, and so does yours. I am black, I am a voter, I am a taxpayer with talents and thoughts and unique perspectives and valuable contributions to make. Yet somehow a few voices decide for all, even though so much is at stake. Entire races, the poor, queer and trans folk, veterans without homes, so many are silenced, ignored, and treated as less than. We're all human, not contraband to be seized and appeased with hollow sayings at your campaign speeches like, I stand for equity, or I don't see color. Do you see the red, white, and blue flag on that pickup truck headed to the anti-Semitic rally? Or the black, brown, and red history being whited out in classrooms and libraries? Or the blue beating the black over and over and over again? Yes, we all bleed red, but our blood continues to be constantly shed. Scripture says be patient in affliction and joyful in hope, but can we afford to keep doing that? To wait for you to feel less threatened? To understand your privilege? To stop with your childish ways of, gimme, that's mine. That's the real crime. For my dues have long been paid. For generations we have stayed. We pick up our bootstraps daily despite the cement in our Timberlands, less food in our bellies the lack of a quality education, needing a lawyer to just navigate being a citizen and being paid less than men for the same job. Again, who is the one being robbed? So many policies created to keep us down, but what you thought was lost is now found. Resilient in mind and in spirit with something worthy and necessary to say and gaining in momentum and traction so stop endorsing inequity with your silence and inaction. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Alicia, for starting us on the right foot. What you thought was lost is now found. We still have hope. And today is about that hope, that we're doing something to make sure, again, all Rhode Islanders get to the all. I really appreciate you, my sister, for joining us here today and starting us on the right track. And now I would like to welcome Alan Krinsky, EPI's Director of Research and Fiscal Policy and the lead author to present this collective equity review of the governor's 2024 budget. Alan? Thank you, Aaron. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to share with you today this document and equity review of the proposed fiscal year 2024 budget for Rhode Island. Um, we all mentioned it's high day, 314, March 14th. I suppose sometimes the state budget is um, depicted in a pie chart. And maybe if we use an equity lens, we can see how that pie is, is sliced uh, in a way that we don't usually do that. Uh, Anyway, last year in Connecticut, the legislature made it a requirement for the governor to include in the presentation of the proposed budget an explanation of the ways it furthered equity in the state. 
And only a few weeks ago, Governor Lamont released his proposed fiscal year 24-25 budget and met the requirement by including in his budget proposal a detailed review of ongoing and newly proposed policies and programs that would impact equity. Should Representative Cordren's HB 6110 and Senator Acosta's SB 527 be enacted, Rhode Island's governor will have a similar task as part of the presentation of a proposed budget starting next year. The document we're sharing today takes a somewhat different approach from the Connecticut example, providing another model of how such equity, how such an equity review might be done. I want to thank the many partners who contributed towards this document, providing sections of the review and offering edits and other feedback. In this regard, I want to note that not every item shared made it into the document. And this is not a comprehensive review of the proposed budget. We highlight nine different policy areas, sometimes even a very specific item within a policy area. So this document is intended to provide some examples of how to use an equity lens, not to be a definitive analysis of the proposed budget in terms of equity. Let me share just one example from the document. In 2013, Rhode Island became one of the first states to start a paid family medical leave program. This program provides people with job security, allowing them to keep their jobs while taking paid time off to care for an ill family member or to bond with a new child. This funded through employee contributions into the TCI TDI system. Now, besides the fact that our program offers a max of six weeks, half of what most such programs offer, what happens when we apply an equity lens to the program? Well, folks have looked at the data from the Department of Labor and Training, and it turns out that lower income workers are opting to use the system at a lower rate than they're paying into the system. We also know that lower wage workers are disproportionately women and Rhode Islanders of color, regardless of gender. So an equity lens has helped identify a problem. Can it help us identify a cause and possible solution? It turns out that the current paid leave, leave program provides a maximum of 60% of one's wages or salary. Imagine you're a low-wage worker earning around, let's say, $20,000 and having a hard time getting by. Let's round off a little and say you're getting $400 per week. Now we offer you the opportunity to stay home for six weeks to take care of a very ill parent. We're offering you only $240 per week to do so. You're already having trouble getting by and you turn it down because you do not see how you can make, how you can manage and make ends meet on $160 less per week for those six weeks. A solution included as happens in Representative Diaz's HB 5447 to be heard tomorrow at the House Labor Committee would be to increase the wage replacement rate to 75% or 90% for low income workers so they can take advantage of the program. Given what we noted before about racial and gender wage disparities, this solution would increase equity in the state. This is one of nine examples you can find in the equity review document we're releasing today, as we urge support for the budget equity legislation and other equity legislation introduced as part of this campaign. In each case, we describe briefly the current budget stat state of, uh, of a program or policy, Note what if any equity proposals are included in the proposed budget and then present additional opportunities for increasing equity. What policymakers should be doing is looking at policy areas of policies and programs and applying an equity lens. So that when a governor prepares and proposes a budget, they can say, here are the existing programs and expenditures and how they already address equity concerns. And here are our new proposals targeted to further decreasing the disparities based upon race, gender, disability, age, and other factors. Applying an equity lens enables us to see the opportunities and to respond to them. Let me note also that this document is not intended as a critique of the proposed budget. The point is to highlight those policies and proposals that would reduce disparities and increase equity, as well as to identify additional opportunities in this regard. Overall, and this is why it is valuable to focus on the state budget, in addition to considering disparities and equity in terms of individual pieces of legislation, overall, we hope to suggest a different way of looking at how we legislate. My hope is that we can arrive at a point where the use of an equity lens to evaluate policy becomes second nature, where it becomes a standard part of the process of legislating and authorizing expenditures. After all, the budget is the largest and single most important piece of legislation policymakers consider each year. And the budget is a moral document and expression of our values. If we indeed value 
trying to reduce existing disparities and increase equity, then we need to evaluate the state budget in these terms to consider all parts of the budget and the budget as a whole in terms of how it advances equity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan, for that presentation. Um, we will be sharing We will be sharing the official equity review with the press and to members of the public right after this um, press conference and launch. So stay thrown. We hope you can review it, go through it, um, give us feedback on it. And we're hoping that we can have legislation requiring a governor's office to do an equity review starting next year. So on that note, I would now like to turn it over to our legislative champions who are introducing equity bills this year as priorities of this equity impact campaign. We will start with the legislation that will be requiring the governor's office to provide an equity report of the proposed state budget starting next year. Please join me in giving a well welcome to Senator Acosta who has introduced Senate Bill 527. Thank you, Wayona. Thank you to the EPI and everybody who has been part of this. I apologize for the, the background noise and, and for my brevity um, because of the weather. I, I have some friends um, that are home. Uh, daycare has, has closed down early today. So uh, in, in the interest of time and, and, and an effort to not reiterate what has been said before, I want to speak very quickly on, on this bill, what we hope it might do, uh, what we can see from the Connecticut example. And, and also from this alternative path that, that Alan has suggested we might be able to go on. And, you know, I, I think what we envision this doing is giving the executive, current and any future of the state, an opportunity, I, I will be quiet, Skin, I'm working on it, uh, an opportunity to present to us in their budget uh, an explanation of how they see equity. Uh, you know, the, <laughs> There, there's a, a running joke in, in, in the state house that a governor will often propose a budget and then it becomes the general assembly's job to, to dispose of it in some ways. Um, and I think it's important for us to, to think about what the negotiation process looks like between the general assembly and the executive, um, also between the general public and what is being proposed in a budget. We know that budget documents can be very dense, very difficult to read. They don't always, they, they often include the amount of money that we're spending, but not the intent behind that money or how folks envision it being used in particular initiatives. And so we would like to see uh, a world in which the governor proposes a budget and with it uh, produces a document that allows us to see how they're envisioning that budget addressing issues of equity in our state, uh, what types of initiatives that they're proposing. Uh, that way, when we have a conversation, not just with members of his administration and the General Assembly, but also with the public, we can talk through what some of the things are that, you know, we, we must keep, that, that are must-haves, and which things, you know, don't quite get us there. And so I'll share a very brief uh, experience that I had in, in my first year in the Senate. You know, I, I consider myself someone who tries to be a champion for issues around equity, and yet, you know, I was unaware of how long it had been that our state had not touched, looked at, or seriously considered raising the cash benefit for RI Works beneficiaries. And that blew my mind. As someone who has, who has benefited from various public assistance programs, you know, it spoke to me about how little we care about poor people in this state and how easy it is to keep them out of mind. And I, I, I now look back, considering the bill that we have in front of us and think, you know, what, would have, what, what, it, what it might have meant if every year from the last time that we really worked on Rhode Island Works, really in the late 90s, you had to have a governor go on record and say, you know, we're not going to do, um, <laughs> we're not going to do anything about this um, and really push people to have a public conversation about that. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm honored by the EPI working on this and asking me to, to try to be their champion for it in my chamber and uh, you know I have a ton of gratitude for, for the coalition that stands behind this and, and for all my co-sponsors. So thank you all very much and I'll uh, get back to, to wrangling my children. 
Thank you so much, um, Senator Acosta. We're really honored that you're taking this on because you're right. Um, you know, let's have the conversation. If it's not in the bills, if it's not in the budget, let's talk about why and let's do something again because we want, I think we all have the same value to make sure Rhode Island is a great place to live and this can help us get to it. Um, I would now like to introduce um, Rep. Corrange, who has introduced a companion bill in the House, Bill H6610. Thank you. And thank you to everyone that's here today. Um, I, too, am honored to have been asked to put this forward. Um, I think Senator Acosta and Alan did an excellent job of explaining of how we're going to get there or what we're aiming to, to do. Um, for me, this is my first year sitting on finance, so it is pretty interesting to just watch the agencies come forward with uh, really the nuts and bolts, but not really the uh, feeling and the goals behind it. And so I do think this would really add to the process. And, um, and Senator Acosta mentioned another thing as we go through as the House goes through the, the budget and the Senate goes through the budget and then it goes up with leadership goes through the budget with the governor's office and we don't always know what happens during those conversations, but um, having to come back and explain to the public and having that initial um, statement from the governor, I think will really uh, will make a difference. So, um, I don't wanna repeat what everybody has said, but I'm honored to be working with you all. And I look forward to the feedback that we hear when we have the hearing and um, let's see how the process goes. Let's get this done. Thank you, Rep. Conference. Um, and we are again pleased that an honor that you could take this on in the house. And we wanna thank the co-sponsors that have also signed up um, to, the, to these bills. It starts with the budget. We all care about so many policies um, for our communities, but all of it starts with the budget. And so we're happy that we have these bills saying, let's start with the budget and let's do an equity review every year to make sure, um, as Senator Costa said, we're not spending 30 years before we pay attention um, to the harm that is being done um, in certain communities. And so in addition to the budget bills, um, we were really excited when we had the budget bills and we decided, well, let's just keep going. You know, if we're going to do equity, we had a meeting with the campaign and they said, no, we're not just going to pass, try to pass two bills. Let's go as far as we can because it's important. Um, and so we have two more bills that have been introduced this year. Senator Matt is in here, um, but she has introduced um, Senate Bill 636 which will require racial impact assessment of criminal justice legislation, as well as in other areas, including education, healthcare, and employment. And so we're really excited um, to see that bill introduced in the Senate as well. And then finally, um, we have Bill H5763, introduced by Rep. Um, Kislak, requiring equity impact statement in legislation. Rep. Kislak have taken on the torch from former Rep. Um, Liana Kassar, who introduced this bill in the last two years. We were prepared today and ready because it was going to be up for hearing, um, and we were ready to go. And we're going to be ready to go on Friday um, at 3 p.m. when the bill will be heard. And so stay tuned for more information on that. But I would like to introduce Rep. Kislak up right now to talk more about her bill. Thank you so much. I am, um, other reps and senators have said this, but really honored to be a part of this like incredibly strong team working for equity and making sure that we are thinking and talking about equity and, and doing equity. I wanna start by um, saying my notes are, are beautiful right now and I don't exactly understand where I got each piece while I was just listening to people talk and sing uh, earlier, but Weona said something about equity and joy, I think was something that came back from one 
one of your surveys. And so my notes say equity equals joy, which isn't exactly right, but I think equity supports joy. And I don't think that we think about joy enough in the world. So I, um, I, I, I am going to keep as an intention, remembering that if we're fighting injustice, and a lot of us on this call are really good at that, it is also interfering with our or other people's ability to experience joy. And, and Alicia's song was full of so much joy and urgency and importance when you sang so beautifully, Alicia, my voice belongs here. And I just wanna raise all of that up because together we can do some great work while being focused on joy and dignity and respect and really supporting that for each other and for everyone. So the bill that I am sponsoring, and I again wanna to thank uh, former Representative Kassar for really getting this conversation going in the House last year. The bill would ask me and my colleagues to draft an equity statement and attach it to all of our legislation. Any bill that we introduce could impact equity in good ways or bad ways or, or sometimes both. And if we believe in building an inclusive and an equitable state, I know all of us here do, and I hope everyone does, we should be acknowledging that our policies from the General Assembly in housing and education, healthcare, criminal justice, and more affect different populations among us differently. And I know that if we don't deliberately think about what we're doing, we might not take a minute to think about the possible positive or negative consequences of what we are doing. And I know that Alan mentioned earlier that that just saying it and um, doing, and, and Senator Acosta also said that uh, by analyzing the budget, we're gonna have to name things and then we can talk about whether we or our colleagues got it right or wrong um, and have something to react to. And I also know that practicing talking about equity is really important too, because even if we all believe in it, if we're not talking about it, we're not going to move it forward as effectively. So I want to thank everyone for being here and thank you for including me and in this legislation in this really important package. Uh, so thank you. Oh, our hearing will be on Friday. It has been postponed from today until Friday at three. And so I hope to see many of you in the house or to be reading your letters online. One of the great things that the house has started doing is publishing all the written testimony online so we can go and look at it whenever we want. And so if you can't come in person, your letter will be online forever or for however long they keep it. And um, the hearing is at three o'clock on Friday in the house. And when I finish talking, I will post the details. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Kislev. We are excited and we're ready to go on Friday. So come testify and then you can go out and celebrate St. Patrick's Day. If you do, it will be a good way to end. Um, and David, I see you say you love this event. I do too. And I cannot wait for us to do this in person. So we're going to find opportunities to meet. Um, the weather tried to get us down, but we're here and we're going because we know how important equity is to our state. Um, so please give it up, give up some more emojis for our legislative champions who are taking this on. Um, as members of this campaign, we're going to do our part to make sure these bills pass this session. Because um, most of the time, new bills, we introduce it, we know it takes a long time, but why wait, right? Our time is here, our voice belongs here, as Alicia said, so we're going to give it our all this year to make sure these bills pass. And we're gonna be next year, if it doesn't, with more bills, um, because we wanna make sure equity is centered across all of the policies in Rhode Island. And now to close this launch, we have three community partners who are supporters and members of this campaign to share what the work means to them, to share what equity means to the people they serve, and to share what equity means to the people they are as residents of Rhode Island. First up, 
please give a warm welcome to Dr. Akela Dolan, Associate Professor at Brown University School of Public Health and lead of the State of Black Rhode Island Project. Thank you so much, Wayona and EPI for inviting me to speak today. So I'll keep my comments short. Um, a little bit about the State of Black Rhode Island is that we are an initiative that includes a community collaborative focusing on advancing equity for Black Rhode Islanders. Often we find that information is presented that groups Black Rhode Islanders with other racial and ethnic groups. And this masks significant inequities due to historic and current structural racism in policies and the everyday life experiences of Black Rhode Islanders. So uh, we've been working to identify where these inequities lie and to advocate for policy changes. Specifically, we're looking at existing data to identify how Black Rhode Islanders are doing compared to others locally and nationally. We're conducting interviews with Black Rhode Islanders, and now we're getting ready to release our, I'm sorry, and we plan to work with adolescents to document their lived experiences. So we released a home ownership report last year, and now we're getting ready to release our criminal justice report that documents glaring racial disparities in incarceration rates for Black Rhode Islanders over the past 11 years. This report also calls for the inclusion of racial equity oriented policies. So we borrowing from the uh, sentencing project which found that in 2019, Rhode Island ranked as the 18th worst state for its black white incarceration rate ratio disparity. Our work also found that in 2020, this disparity was almost tenfold greater for black Rhode Islanders compared to white Rhode Islanders. We are very happy to support the equity campaign launched by EPI in collaboration with partners to advocate for legislation that requires racial equity impact assessments in all criminal justice system legislation a racial equity impact assessment could reduce racial disparities, increase racial equity, and avoid unintended negative consequences or effects of legislation. We believe that the assessment should be applied to all existing and potential criminal justice legislation. We also believe that the results of the assessments should be released publicly and include opportunities for public comment and revision to mitigate racially disparate outcomes for Black Rhode Islanders. And these mitigations should be applied retroactively to Black Rhode Islanders who have been harmed by prior criminal justice legislation. So as I mentioned before, uh, we're getting ready to release our report and hope to disseminate it widely and stimulate additional support for racial equity impact assessments in criminal justice legislation as introduced by Senator Mack. If possible, I'll include my email address in the chat so that you can contact me if you'd like to receive this upcoming report. Thank you again, Wayona and EPI. Thank you so much, Dr. Dolan, for being a part of this campaign and for working on the State of Black Rhode Island Project. We're looking forward to the release of the Criminal Justice Report, and we hope you all can support that and continue the conversations. Um, and then speaking of the Sentencing Project, I would like to recognize Nicole Carter. I'm putting her on the spot from the Sentencing Project. I got introduced to Nicole last year, two days before the equity impact legislation was introduced, um, trying to get her to testify. She tried within her mark and say, I can't, but I'm going to support Rhode Island to get equity impact statement introduced. And Nicole has shown up. She was there um, when we launched in December and brought um, legislators from Maryland and Iowa to talk about their equity impact statements and have been working as a consultant on this project. So Nicole, I don't, should I put you on the spot to say something? She's like saying you no, know, yes. Just okay. that I am so um, inspired by this conversation and the leadership that you all are collaborating on to ensure racial equity in Rhode Island. So congratulations for this launch and all of the hard work that's gone into today. Thank you, Nicole. We're really happy to have your support. Um, and now I would like to turn it over to Kelly Nevins, the Executive Director of the Women's Fund of Rhode Island. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here and really honored to be part of this group of legislators and organizations and individuals who are working to create a more equitable Rhode Island. You know, since 2001, the Women's Fund has been investing in women and girls through research, advocacy, grant making and strategic partnerships designed to achieve gender equity through systemic change. 
we put out regular research reports. Um, we have a, a women's well-being index that compares how well women do with men in every city and town throughout Rhode Island and where possible. Uh, it breaks it down also uh, by racial ethnic data. Um, and we use that as a fact-based platform to advocate for change. Why, why is it important? It's, it's important because this data shows that gender and racial-based inequities have existed in Rhode Island for, for decades and, and hundreds of years, frankly, which impacts women's economic security, their health and safety, and their political engagement. Today is Equal Pay Day, um, and if you don't know what that is, it is the day where uh, all women's wages catch up with the wage that men will have earned last year through December 31st. Today, women in Rhode Island make 84 cents on the man's dollar, but when you then intersect that with, for example, racial and ethnic data, you'll see that Black women make 60 cents on that dollar and Latina women in Rhode Island make less than 50 cents on that dollar. And many of these women are the sole breadwinners for their families. Other inequities exist. Only one in five women serve in the C-suite uh, the, at the corporate level. So the chief executive officer, chief financial officer, et cetera. Only one in 30 are women of color. And today, while well, we're very proud that women represent 40% of elected positions throughout the state, it's not equitable because we make up 51% of the population. And unfortunately, in that 40%, only 15% of them are women of color. So when you start overlaying with other intersections, whether it be race and ethnicity, whether it be ability, whether it be sexual preference or identity, all of these different things uh, impact the way Rhode Islanders live and are able to thrive in our state. We assume that our legislators are putting forward bills with good intent. But the information that organizations like ours provide, provide lagging indicators for what is really happening in Rhode Island. Unfortunately, one of the stark realities is that uh, when we hold our hearings, often they are held during times when people can't get to the state house to testify. And so they can't necessarily share their lived experience or they may not even know how to do so. We are asking legislators to consider the impact of the bills proactively that they are putting forward. Just take a moment and really figure out, you know, is the intent of my bill, if I follow this through, how is it going to impact those communities that have experienced inequi inequities uh, over the decades? By doing so, we think that uh, we will be spending our money more thoughtfully and in a, in a, a much better way. The final thing that I'll just note is that our budget reflects what our priorities are. If we're not taking the time to say the budget that we are putting forward and the again, the legislation that we're putting forward is going to impact these communities in this way, we're wasting money and we're also not working to truly achieve the things that we would like to see making Rhode Island the best state to live in. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, and I would like to acknowledge Kelly and the Women's Fund for supporting this campaign from the very be beginning. When I became um, EPI's executive director, I had my meeting with Kelly probably in February or March last year. We talked about it and she was on board to support it. So we appreciate you for all of your support and being a part of the campaign. Our final speaker is Tina Pedersen, the founder, CEO, and president of RAMT, Real Access Motivates Progress, and the New West appointee by President Joe Biden to serve on the Agricultural and Transportation Barriers Compliance Access Board. Tina, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me today. It is such an honor to be among all of you. Um, and being part of such great work that all of you are doing. So thank you to EPI for having me here today. When you're talking disability, you are talking everything. You are talking gender, you are talking race, you are talking every single community out there um, in Rhode Island. Um, if you're talking equity and you're not talking accessibility, 
you're doing it wrong because you're missing out on 30, 40 percent of the population that uses a mobility aid, whether it's a walker, wheelchair or a cane, either permanently or temporarily. So if you're not seeing us in your spaces, you're missing out on so many people. And we come with people. Uh, we come with family and friends. Um, we talk about it as the idea, inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. The idea, open your perspective to anybody. Disability is the largest minority in this country. We are also the only minority that anyone can join at any time. As I learned just nine short years ago when I suffered a spinal stroke. We can't talk about inequity, uh, equity when we are can't get to places. I am only allowed to be able to speak at this conference today because we were able to do it on Zoom. I can't get to the state house. And even when somebody like me in my power wheelchair gets to the state house, there's one way in and one way out. Um, a lot of people feel trapped. A lot of people feel you know, that it's not accessible. We have one wheelchair accessible taxi in this entire state. Um, I can't get into the businesses to get the application to even be in the running. It doesn't matter the color of my skin or my gender. I have the physical accessibility that blocks me from getting on a bus, from getting in a place, from using a taxi, from getting around, um, from housing. You know, we're building all of this great affordable housing, but how much of it are we building accessible for those of us in the community? In 2030, the baby boomers will all be 60 years of older. 40% of them are gonna be using a mobility aid. Is the area around them accessible? Are they able to get their haircut, their food or play with everybody else? Probably not um, because we need to make sure that we're being equitable to everybody. So use the idea, inclusion, diversity, equity and accessibility. Together we are stronger and I fully believe that. We're in every community. And again, if you're not seeing us, search us out because you're missing out on 30 to 40% of the population by not allowing us to be a part of living, working and playing in the communities. You're missing out on some really amazing people for the mere fact of the inaccessibility. It's not my disability that causes me issue, it's the world is inaccessibility that does. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tina. I am glad you could be here. Um, and I think just your story of not being able to get to the state house um, was important for this launch, right? In thinking about those questions. And I think that's what the point of the equity impact campaign is. We need to be asking ourselves those questions about why are certain Rhode Islanders not having access? Why are certain Rhode Islanders still behind? We still have disparities. We still have percentages. We still have equal pay day. Um, and so what equity impact does is to create a pause, a moment for our leaders to think about the why and then to think about solutions to solve the problem of the why. Um, and so that is the point of the campaign and I appreciate you um, sharing your story with us today. Can we give more emojis um, to all of our speakers and legislative champions who spoke here today? I would now like to thank all the members and I'm gonna ask Alan to please share. There are many organizations behind this campaign that have been working at a, on a such a short timeline Drafts after drafts, probably got tired of seeing my email pop up in their inbox, um, but were patient through it all because they wanted us to get to this point, um, knowing the importance of this campaign and knowing the transformation um, this can have on Rhode Island. And so I thank you. I thank you all for being here through it all. And I thank you all for your willingness and commitment to seeing this through. I would also like now to pause and give special thanks to the EPI team. Um, when I say I have the best team in the world, I mean it. So transparency, um, throughout February, I was sick with COVID and it turned into pneumonia. All of this while working with legislation, legislators to introduce equity impact bills, while trying to prepare for the launch of this campaign, while onboarding two new staff members, please give it up for Andrew Grant, our new communications director, and Nina Harrison, our new policy director, doing all of this why sake. And how was it possible? It was possible because everything you see here from day, 
today, from the bills that were introduced, from putting the launch together, from working with our partners, I owe it all to the EPI team, a team of amazing people. And so I ask you to join me in the chat and with emojis, we're gonna use what we have on Zoom. So please thank my team because I don't have enough words to show them how much of gratitude I have for them. Thank you so much for holding it down. And even though I'm not well, I'm energized and ready to go and inspire because of the people I get to work with every day. Thank you. Thank you all partners for thanking the EPI team that's ready to continue to lead um, this campaign going forward. And now I would like to pause because this is also a press conference um, and we're gonna do a little differently. Usually the press will have a moment to interview members of the coalitions um, in person. We're also gonna give the press um, that opportunity to reach out through Andrew um, if you want to do post interviews. But if there are any questions the press have now, we'll stop sharing the um, slideshow if you want to raise your hand and we'll um, recognize you for at least five minutes if anyone have one or two questions they would like to ask at this time. And if not, that's perfectly fine too. We'll be happy to follow up with you. Going once. Going twice, because we want to enjoy, if you can, the snow day. Okay, so we'll follow up with the press and we will be sharing the um, um, official release of the equity review after this um, launch and press conference. And so now, in the words of my good friend and partner, Paige Kosha Spark, the ED of the Rhode Island Kids Count, it's time to get to work. We have some equity bills that we need to pass. And so thank you for showing up today. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for your support. But now it's time to get to work to center equity in Rhode Island because we want a Rhode Island where it's the best place to live. And we get to do that when we all get to do all. And I am happy to start this joining with you and continue this joining with you. Let's get to work. Thank you, everybody.